take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, and we're uh, actually doing Religious People Part 2. This is a month back since the last time we were here, so you'll just bear with me as we try to do a little bit of a review and get into what we're doing today. And yes, I do have a cough drop in, so if you hear me crunching on something later, that's what it is. <coughs> I'm getting over possibly flu, so anyways... Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 16. So Jesus came to Nazareth, on where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. And then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elijah the prophet and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him, uh, thrust him out of the city. And they led him through the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. Let's pray. Father, as we gather as your church today and we seek your truth, I pray that it would penetrate the hearts of the people that are here. And Father, I don't know what's on the minds of everybody here. I know that they have come in seeking to worship with your church, so I ask that it be done in purity and truth and the spirit you'd have us to do it in. I ask that you'd empower me to speak the words that need to be spoken and that there be understanding because your word was brought out to them today. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're getting close. <clears throat> in a couple more sermons, we'll eliminate our congregational verse and add in another one because I believe you will have had this one by that time. Luke 5.32. It says what, church? I love that. That's so awesome. Uh, for pastors, there are certain passages of Scripture that serve as turning points in their ministry. And this passage of Scripture was that for me several years ago. When you start identifying the characters and their positions in this narrative, it becomes eye-opening rather quickly. It is something that's hard to deal with being a pastor and knowing what this passage is about. Israel was a devout religious people in the days of Christ. No longer were they chasing after idols or bowing down to pagan kings. Instead, they followed strict dietary laws and traditions which seemed to support their beliefs, but they forgot about one thing, and that one thing was God. They divorced their practices from their relationship with God. They basically 
became a works-based society, believing that salvation was inherited through what they did or who they were related to. It's just simply not true. Jesus grew up around that mentality. Those in Nazareth, as well as the surrounding communities, believed the same thing. He had been preaching in an extensive Judean ministry which lasted for one-third of his ministry. We see them coming out of the wilderness. We see Jesus coming out of the wilderness. And as soon as he comes out of the wilderness, he enters back into a preaching ministry that seems to take place in Galilee. But that was not entirely true. He had spent one-third of his preaching, teaching ministry In the book of John, you can go back and look at that in the first couple chapters. But now he's coming back, he's preaching to his own people, he's in the region of Galilee, and he's in a synagogue speaking to his own people. He's actually talking to the people of Nazareth that he grew up around. When he came in, the Chazan came and handed him a scroll And the scroll was from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. He read and he began to proclaim from that scroll. He began to teach from it. He began to tell them the truths that were in that scroll. He told them in the middle of it that he was the fulfillment of that prophecy. He in no uncertain terms, anybody with any education whatsoever, had just told them that he was the Messiah. Folks. If you grew up around Jesus, if he was over at your house every now and then, and suddenly he's in a synagogue, and he says, the acceptable year of the Lord is here, I'm Messiah, deal with it, how would you react? It would be strange to say the least. I gave you one point many weeks ago, which was religious people accept some scriptural truths. When Jesus read Isaiah, the people agreed with what the passage said. They just didn't think it applied to them. People will say that they agree with the truths in the word of God until it's applied to them. You better believe it. I could walk through this entire congregation, read you scripture and verse, until you get to the application side of things, And when you start talking about that, how we're going to move it, how we're going to use it out in the world, then all of a sudden people are like, no, 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 no. I don't like that. Jesus came to spread the gospel, the good news of his arrival to people that were poor, brokenhearted, captive, blind, and oppressed. But the people didn't see themselves in that situation. You know, I'm not blind, I can see. I've got scriptural knowledge of things, he can't be talking to me. But Jesus was talking to that entire group. And they get so angry that we'll see near the end of the sermon today that they try to kill Jesus in his own town. Try to push him off a cliff. Religious people think that life here and afterwards is covered simply by the merit of whom they are and what they've done. And that's simply not true. The 19th century Danish theologian Soren Kierkegaard identified two kinds of religion. Religion A and religion B. Religion A was a faith in name only. It was people who attended church people who came around and seemed to do religious things. They had certain practices that they took place in. And then there was religion B. It was life transforming, destiny changing. It was something where there was a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that could be seen and they saw God as the gracious Savior of their life. This difference explains why for many years the British author C.S. Lewis had such a great difficulty becoming a Christian. Religion A had blinded him to religion B. According to his brother Warren, his conversation, excuse me, his conversion was no sudden plunge into a new life, but rather a slow, steady convalescence from a deep-seated spiritual illness. 
an illness that had its origins in its childhood, in the dry husk of religion offered by the semi-political church going of Ulster, and the similar dull emptiness of compulsory church during their school days. In other words, they were practicing what Christianity looked like to many people, what it might have actually been to many people, but they had divorced it from God in that intimate relationship with Him. This passage was written to distinguish between religious people and those who humbly surrender to the good news of Jesus Christ. Are you a religious person or are you a follower of Christ? Are you a religious person or are you a follower of Christ? That's what this passage is getting at. If you'll pay attention to how Jesus attacks the synagogue at that time, I think you'll get a great deal out of it. The first distinction that Luke makes between religious people and Christians is that religious people accept some scriptural truths. And second, I want you to see that religious people reject some scriptural truths. The atmosphere around Jesus changed quickly when the people realized what he was really saying. Hearing him speak was undoubtedly amazing. He was an amazing orator, able to deliver the word with passion, with purity like they had never heard. And when he read that passage of scripture, everybody was like, Amen, preacher, we like to hear it. And then they figured out that he was trying to talk to them. Some of them started to say, is this Joseph's son? I mean, is this the same kid that we watched grow up? Is this the same kid that we babysit for that time? Doubt started to come into their mind. Anger started to fill them. And a rather electric scene takes place. Before anyone really responded to Jesus or became angry, he said this, starting in verse 23, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever you have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Anticipating what they were going to say next, Jesus made the physician comment to them, which was both a proverb and a prophecy at the same time. Initially, the axiom or proverb that was used by Jesus called attention to what everyone was thinking. Sometime shortly after Jesus came walking out of the wilderness, he went into a time of ministry. That time of ministry where he was in the Judean Proverbs. He he was speaking to people, teaching people, doing miracles during that time. If you go back and you read the calling of the disciples, that supernaturally took place. So he calls them, they just follow up, they up and leave their jobs and they come after him. It wasn't too much later where the miracle of Cana of Galilee took place where he turned water into wine. So the people got to see that. They got to see all of that taking place. He had gone into Capernaum and there's not a lot written there where he takes a respite of sort. He, he's resting for a little while. It says he's with his mothers and brothers. But there was other teachings and miracles that must have been happening there. Now what the people are saying to him, when they say, physician, heal thyself, is they're saying, hey, be a prophet, do the same miracles in front of us. Whatever we've heard going on back there, whatever has been happening over the last year, we want to see the same thing happen here. Jesus, prove yourself. Listen, Jesus did authenticate his ministry through miracles and signs. That did happen. But he didn't do it whenever you told him to. He was kind of like the father that way, wasn't he? You couldn't just command Jesus to do a miracle and him stand up and do it. The Pharisees, the Sadducees tried to do the same thing to Jesus. He said, you'll see no sign but the sign of Jonah. You're not going to force my hand on anything. The physician comment was a prophecy also. He knew he would hear the same sentiment when he was hanging on the cross. Physician, heal thyself. Mark chapter 15, 29 through 32 those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild in three days, save yourself. 
come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. So many see that as the prophecy that was fulfilled in the physician, heal thyself, further on comment uh, later in the history of Jesus and his ministry. Religious people reject some scriptural truths simply because they are from people too close to them. Jesus rejected the first proverb by giving another one. Verse 24 says, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. No prophet is completely rejected in their own country either. You need to understand that there were prophets during Jesus' day and before that did mighty things in their locale where they grew up. If no prophet was completely, if no prophet was able to do ministry at all in their own area, then you'd have prophets like Jonah and Hosea who couldn't have done anything. And as a matter of fact, you would have his own mother not believing him if no prophet was successful in their own area and his sisters and brothers, which eventually came to know him as Lord and Savior. Surely I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Even though there are exceptions to the rule, this proverb really does make sense. If I were to go back to Casey, South Carolina and preach at my home, there's no telling what might happen. Uh, when I came up, things were a little bit different. I used to watch little boys run around this church have over the past couple years I've seen them do some things where heads have gone like this once they've come past them uh, they've said and done things that remind me much of myself and I start to think to myself you know I'm not going to be too quick to pass judgment on these little guys because they could end up being the pastors of this church later on I'll tell you a quick story. I won't get into too much of it, but I grew up in a church where I got in trouble a lot. Uh, I, I, and, and thankful. I'm not saying it was a bad thing. I got in trouble a lot. The deacons were chasing me around. Had many times where I was pulled in and, and got my fanny wore out when I got home from what had happened. But folks, there was... A time about two years ago before I came here where I was invited to a church that's locally in Columbia I was able to preach there. And when I walked in, I got to see two of my former Sunday school teachers. I was in middle school. I could tell that they didn't like me very much. I didn't like them. The husband was being bossed around by the wife, so I commented on it. In Sunday school, it did nothing less than irritate them. There were many weeks where they walked out and they were fighting over what had happened in Sunday school. I knew what I was doing. I was provoking them. And then I had gone back to Columbia two years ago and went to preach in a church that they were currently attending. Folks, a prophet <laughs> is not accepted in his own country. Religious people reject some scriptural truth. In our next section of scripture, Jesus makes a proclamation that would have immediately offended those listening. Look at verses 25 and 26. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. Wanting to see, wanted the people to see that there was no guile in his heart, Jesus said that he was telling them the truth. Knowing that there were, they were about to reject him, he interjects a story about Elijah that everyone would have been familiar with. 
being a widow in those days was very tough, but it would have been only compounded if there was a drought and a famine. The Israelites were commanded to take care of the widows. In Exodus 22, 22, it says, You shall not afflict any widow or orphan. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, 17 through 21, You shall not pervert the justice due an alien or an orphan, nor take a widow's garment in pledge. But you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and that the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I am commanding you to do this thing. When you reap your harvest in your field and have forgotten a sheep that's in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the alien, for the orphan, and for the widow, in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the works of your hands. When you beat your olive tree, which all of us do regularly, when you beat your olive tree, you shall not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the alien, for the orphan, and for the widow. When you gather the grapes of the vineyard, you shall not go over it again. It shall be for the alien, the orphan, and for the widow. These and many other passages point to the need to take care of the widows of their day. However, it would have been extremely difficult if they were in a famine. When you run out of food, when you run out of water, what you're looking to take care of is what? Your immediate family. So if there's this person that may be related to you, but they're a widow, and they're out there on your own, you don't have food to put on your own table. You're not going to help them. This was an extremely difficult time for Israel. And many of them that might have been crying out to God weren't hearing the answers that they wanted to hear from him during that time. And widows back then were very different than what we look at today. Simply being without a husband wouldn't have qualified you as a widow. If you want to go back and read on that subject, go back and look at 1 Timothy chapter 5 and see how they detailed what a widow was. Widows would have been to the point where they could not take care of themselves. They could not do any work. They were willing to help out within the church. Go back and look at it for yourself. Everyone has heroes in the faith, and Elijah was definitely that for Israel. However, the story was difficult for God's people to swallow. Zarephath was a little town in the region of Sidon. It was right on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. It was also the territory of the hometown of Jezebel. You remember Jezebel from Scripture, one of the most wicked queens to ever rule in Israel. Jezebel was flat evil, and her husband Ahab was not much better. You remember when she came into power, she had married in through an alliance with the northern country of Israel. Some people believe that they came together and they had these pagan ideals from the very beginning. They had decided that they were going to change the country, the national religion, as it were. When King Ahab married her, remember, he's supposed to be somebody who worships Yahweh. But he's bringing in this woman, Jezebel, who openly worships Baal. So as soon as she comes in, she erects statues, monuments, idols, whatever you want to call them, to Baal and Asherah throughout the, throughout the country throughout her surrounding area. Not only that, she then leads a campaign where they go to try and kill all the prophets of the Lord. She's leading this campaign, and the husband's just sitting back thinking, well, this is a pretty good office. She then takes all these prophets and put them in their private chambers and tries to fatten them up, the prophets of Baal, because she wants them to lead the country. This woman was extremely wicked. Her husband one day went and looked out the window of their home and saw a garden of a neighboring person of the community named Naboth. And Naboth was a man that had this beautiful garden according to scripture. So the king goes over there and he says, will you give me the vineyard? And uh, he's like, you know, I've been in the family for a little while. It's kind of nice. I like having my garden out here. He said, I'm not going to give it to you. So what does he do in return? He turns around, goes back into his chambers, and scripture details the king pouting. He's in there pouting. Jezebel walks through the door. She sees what's going on. 
And she's looking at him, she's like, what's wrong, hubby? He said, well, I wanted that garden over there. Naboth wouldn't give it to me. She said, well, I'll take care of this. So she has a great feast. And she invites Naboth as the guest of honor. And she also has two scoundrels that show up at this feast and say that he was blaspheming the Lord. So once the community hears that he was blaspheming the Lord, they drag Naboth out into the middle of a courtyard and they stone him to death for doing that. For blaspheming God, which never happened in the first place. And so you end up seeing Ahab get the garden that he so much desired. By the time you get to the book of Revelation, it talks about a woman that was ruling a church and she had the spirit of Jezebel. Do you think that that was a kind term for John to use for her? Absolutely not. It was not a kind term. What he was literally saying is there's a woman leading your church. We're supposed to have men as pastors leading the church, but you've got a woman leading you. And not only that, she's teaching the entire congregation to go into and live under immorality. This is the mark of the day for her. Sexual immorality in there. Is what they pushed. Jezebel was not a kind woman. She was evil and her husband wasn't any better. With a drought, a famine, and probably thousands of Israelite widows in need, Elijah went to a widow in Zarephath in the region of the evil queen Jezebel. Israel hated to hear the story, but it didn't stop Jesus from picking that sore. What you have to see in this passage of scripture is Jesus goes for what's going to hurt them the most. Oh, Jesus, he loves. He's got long, flowing blonde hair. He's carrying a lamb on his side. He would never do anything like that. This is what he did. The widow that Jesus spoke of understood repentance. She saw her own poverty, blindness, and oppression. When Elijah initially approached this woman, listen to what she said about herself. This is 1 Kings 17, 18. Elijah speaking to the widow. So she said to Elijah, what have I do to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to bring, to, to bring my sin to remembrance and kill my son? Here there was an admission of sin from a woman that recognized who Yahweh was. She also knew she was wrong and she desperately needed help. The widow believed in truth and logically, if there's only one real truth, then she had to believe in the God of Elijah. 1 Kings 17, 24. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know, I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord, word of the Lord in your mouth is true. Elijah wasn't just sent to a Gentile, but he was sent to a woman as well. Do you know how devout Jewish men would open their prayers in the morning? They religiously play, pray throughout the day, but do you know how they open them up in the morning? One of the first things that would come out of their mouth is, Oh God, I thank you that I'm not a Gentile and especially a woman. We've tried not to carry on that tradition. That was a joke. I, was, I don't know who's with me today. So, of course, the Gentile woman was on the lowest rung of the ladder. Jesus drew a parallel here that no Jew wanted to recognize. He reminded them that Elijah was sent to one of the only godly women around during that day. With hundreds, maybe thousands of Jewish women around, he was sent to a Gentile woman. She recognized her need for help, and that help could only come from the Lord. Remember, Jesus is sitting in a synagogue telling this story. Do you see him poking that sore? Do you see him scraping away at the people as he tells this story? He was telling them, you need help, but you don't recognize it. You believe that everyone else needs help. And my question today, is that you? Do you think that everybody else needs help? And that's not, it couldn't possibly be you. 
Are you the person that believes that you don't need the help? Do you see yourself as poor? Do you see yourself as broken hearted, blind, captive, and oppressed? Because if you don't, you're just like them. Think about who Jesus was talking to here. You know, I've recognized in my own life as a pastor that I will never be rid of this stuff, this flesh. I believe it's going to be around with me for the rest of my life until the day that I die. I'm going to have it and I'm going to deal with the sin that's still in this flesh that drives me every day. But I also have the Holy Spirit. And there's a reminder that goes on constantly in my head that I'm poor, that I'm blind, that I'm oppressed, and that Jesus has saved me. See, that's who he came to save. And everybody's sitting in the room saying, Whew, Jesus, that was a good passage that you read. But this has nothing to do with me. I'm not poor, I'm not blind, I'm not oppressed. I'm not broken hearted. You couldn't possibly be speaking to me. Here's how you can identify if you're that person today. Are you saying... Me or they? I don't know how to make this any simpler. I thought about this for a while. Are you saying they need help? Or I recognize that I need help? Because the people that say, I recognize that I need help, he came for you. That's who he came for. He didn't come for the people that are saying, those people over there need help. It certainly doesn't have anything to do with me. Do you see right now why I put Luke 5.32 as our congregational scripture? I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You've got to understand that the entire group considered themselves to be saved going to heaven. And he's in there saying, folks, I'm looking for those that are poor and broken hearted and blind and captive. Is that you? And they're saying, no, but they're over there. They're over there. Some of the people listening might have been tempted to say that whole Elijah story was an isolated incident. But Jesus made sure that that didn't happen by tacking on another example. Verse 27, it says, And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elijah the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Leprosy was a serious deal among the Israelites. Numbers 5, 2 says, Command the sons of Israel that they send away from the camp every leper and everyone having discharge and everyone who is unclean because of a dead person. This disease was dangerous and the people were just sent away. It most of the time would end fatally for these people unless they were healed miraculously. They didn't come out of it and everybody knew this. Jesus is poking at their national pride. And, and when I say pride, if you ever hear that come out of my mouth, it's not a good thing. He was poking at their national pride. He said, you see yourself being so wonderful. You see yourself being so perfect, but your pride is going to be your downfall. Jesus was literally poking at the hornet's nest. You see him just standing up there with a stick, hitting that thing. This is what's going on in this passage of scripture. He's stirring these people up. So should we be like Jesus? Okay, let's go on then. Instead of helping some of the Israelites, Elijah went to help a, gen a Gentile general in the Syrian army. This was an enormous slap in the face to hear this story even repeated. So why did Jesus bring it up? Naaman was a commanding general under Ben-Hadad, king of Syria. Now, he was known for many military achievements, but they said that the guy had great character as well. The men would gravitate toward him. He was a born leader. There was only one problem with him, though. 
He had leprosy. But they didn't treat him like an outcast. Uh, the Syria didn't. They, they allowed him to stay close at home. He even had a personal servant that at one day came to him and said, I know somebody that can heal you. A guy by the name of Elijah. If you'll go to him, he'll take care of you. So he goes and talks to the king. He gets permission. And he goes over there. And he's expecting to walk up to Elijah, talk to him, and him tell him to do something great. So he goes over there. And he talks to him, and eventually we see that the prophet is healed. He had a servant, one of his own, Naaman's servant, that had to tell him to go and do what Elijah had asked him to do because he wanted some grand gesture to take place. Eventually he does what he's supposed to. If you look back at that story, Gehazi was the servant of Elijah. And he's speaking to Naaman throughout, didn't really have an interaction between Elijah and Naaman himself. But after Naaman is healed, Gehazi runs after Naaman and he said, I know that you came and you brought clothing and silver and my master didn't want any of that stuff. I'll take it. What a benevolent guy. I'll take it. It turns out that Elijah passed on the leprosy to not only Gehazi, but the rest of his family. Leprosy was a serious deal. This guy was a Gentile doll that would have been killing many of the Israelites. People did not want to hear the story. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, it talks about when Naaman was healed. So Naaman went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. When he returned to the man of God, Elijah, with all his company, and came and stood before him, he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. So please take a present from your servant now. Jesus brought this up because... A dirty Gentile dog demonstrated humility and was healed as a result. He went on to proclaim that there was only one God of Israel. Our society has a problem with just that statement. There's only one God of Israel. I don't, I don't have a problem with that. Folks, we invite in other gods all the time. I'll hear people walk through the halls in here and they will proclaim other gods than the ones that's here on the pages of Scripture. You say, I don't hear that going on around here. Folks, when you define God outside of the parameters of Scripture, you're giving Him another name. You're making Him an idol. And if you accept that, then you're doing the same thing that they were doing back then. There's one God and He is repletely demonstrated throughout the pages of Scripture to be Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. I love the interaction that took place because Naaman goes up to the front door, a servant comes out, they talk for a little bit, the servant says, well, my master says to go and dip yourself in the Jordan River. Just go down and dip yourself in the Jordan River seven times and you'll be healed. And he's like, wait a second. I don't like that at all. I don't like any of that because what I wanted to happen is I wanted him to come out, Elijah, this great prophet, and he's supposed to wave his hand over me. Everybody's supposed to get really emotional, and when that's done, I can be healed. Or maybe at the very least, ask me to go down to the Damascus River. It's a lot cleaner. Let me go down there and get bathed. It, it'll be... It, it'll be It'll be a much greater show for the people if I go down there and do that. Everybody will jump up and they'll be excited and it'll be wonderful. Let me go down there and get it done there. No, go to the Jordan River and duck yourself seven times. Now that's what he did. And what you see in that picture is a picture of humility where he is dunking himself in the muddy waters of the Jordan seven times. He couldn't have done it six times because he was asked to do it seven times. I'm sure after three or four times, he's dunking himself under the water. Yeah, this is working. This is great. 
There's nothing happening. But scripture says on the seventh dunk he comes up, he was clean like a child. Skin was completely cleared up. But what he demonstrated there was humility. And that's what the people of Nazareth were not getting. They weren't getting the humility. They kept saying, I'm perfect. I come to synagogue. I do my deal. I I even give my tithes like I'm supposed to. I'm saved. I have a practice every day. We have strict dietary laws. There are only certain things that I can eat. There are even times where I fast. I'm doing all these things. I'm saved. And Jesus is talking to the whole lot of them. He's like, I'm not here for you because I'm looking for the brokenhearted, those who have been captive, the blind, the oppressed. These are the people that I'm here for. But none of you see yourself in that light. You don't see yourself as needing help. I'm here to help people and you don't want it. They wouldn't humble themselves enough just to recognize themselves in that respect. Do you see? Do you see why he was having such a problem with the people during that time? Religious people reject some scriptural truth. They accept some, but they also reject some. Nazareth finally got to see a miracle. It just wasn't the one that they wanted to see. In verses 28 through 30, So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city. Then they led him to the brow and the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. Was Jesus kind in his approach to his own people? What do you think, church? Was he kind in his approach to them? Did he try to develop a relationship with them, say a bunch of sappy things, and hope that everybody would turn to him? No, instead he boldly confronted them with the truth, and they became angry. After many miracle signs and authoritatively bold preaching, Jesus returned to Nazareth, and they still did not believe in him. It says in Mark chapter 6, verse 6, that they wondered, he wondered at their unbelief. How could you still be in that place? He wondered at their unbelief. Today I'm encouraged to emulate the approach of our Savior. This is the acceptable year of the Lord. The Messiah has come. He's shown up. And you know who he's come to save? He's come to save the people that recognize themselves as being poor. You have nothing apart from Christ. You see everything around you as just being material possessions and things that will rust and be moth-eating and fall apart. You see yourself as poor. You see yourself as brokenhearted. You figure to yourself, if I don't have Jesus, then I have nothing I have nothing apart from Christ. I have nothing. You see yourself as blind. You say, I I wouldn't have eyes if it weren't for Christ. I couldn't really see the realities of what's going on here. You see yourself as captive. You were in jail until Jesus showed up and he set you free. And you're constantly reminded of that. That's who he came for. He didn't come for people that one time see sin and say, okay, God, I'm sorry, and they go about the rest of their life doing whatever they please. He wants people that are constantly coming before him saying, I recognize how repugnant my sin is in the eyes of a perfectly pure and holy Savior. That's the approach that Jesus took. That's the approach that he took with the people that came to church. He said, do you see yourself in that? Because if you see yourself in that situation, then I came to save you. If not, I'm not here for you. Religious people reject and accept some scriptural truths. Where are you at? Because you're a religious person if you think that you can go on about your merry way and not continually be dealing with your sin. We are in a process of sanctification where we grow to be more like Christ every day. Where we want to talk to Him, we get into the Word of God. Where we want to talk to Him, we go to Him in prayer. Is that you? People who are saved continually recognize that and they have joy 
They see the joy in the fact that he saved them and he rose on the third day. And if you have that same faith and trust in him that people have had over thousands of years, then you can have a relationship with him today. I don't know where you stand today. Have you been going through the motions? Let me ask you this question. Are you still pointing back to everybody out there and saying, they need help, or you've recognized that you need help? If you've recognized that you need help, then that can be salvation from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you recognize that for yourself, then you need to rejoice. But if you're saying everybody else needs that help, then may God be with you. I've tried to give it to you as clearly as I can. If you're standing in need today and you say, I want to learn more about what it means to become a Christian, a follower of Christ, come and speak to me about that. If you just need to pray, come up here. The uh, platform's open. You can use this at any point. But I encourage you today to do business with God because he's the one that counts. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today and I thank you for loving us the way that you do. I thank you for sending Jesus who was bold in his approach. I thank you for having him at the forefront of what we're supposed to be doing today. God, I ask today that if there's anybody in here that doesn't know you, that you just bring them to salvation. Father, if there's people in here that have a weight on their chest, burden that they need to get off, that they would hand that sin over to you and experience the freedom that only you could give. I ask all these things in Jesus' name.